Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome in from truly across the continent and across the Pacific Ocean with our live speakers in Hawaii today. My name is Jesse. I'm here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And a big welcome to all of you as we get to showcase the coolest conservationist scientists and explorers on planet Earth. Now, today is my birthday. I'm 32. It's been a wild ride. It's a lot of fun. And I honestly could not be happier than to be spending it here with you for what has been the coolest series ever. Now, back in the summer, I got the chance to reach out to Wild Hope. Wild Hope is an amazing partnership of HHMI Tangled Bank Studios, bringing the most incredible conservation stories on planet Earth to life. Now, conservation is a topic that can be very sad, it can be stressful, it can be terrifying, but really at its heart are amazing people working to save planet Earth, save habitat, save species. And Wild Hope sought to share those stories in a way that would excite and inspire communities, kids just like you, and so we are so thrilled to be partnering with them on a 10-part epic series. I really encourage you to check out the entire list of the things that we've done on our Wild Hope page. You can catch our other three broadcasts we've done on our YouTube channel, and there's so, so much to explore and discover at wildhope.tv. Now today, before I dive in with our speaker du jour, which is why I'm especially excited, if you can tell. We will have a Kahoot today. So if you're joining us live or on YouTube, type this in. In about 25 minutes, we'll do a four-question quiz together, test your understanding, have a little bit of fun. Now, I'm so excited today, too. Not just to be in Wild Hope series, but we are live in Hawaii at the Coral Resilience Lab. In the field of conservation, there are a few really, really special places that are regarded as like the best of the best in the world. And the Coral Resilience Lab is in the uppermost echelon. They might even be the top. They do such incredible work to understand and preserve coral reefs. They have a legendary scientist as their sort of backdrop and founder. Uh, and today we're gonna have the chance to explore with the amazing Maddie Sherman, the lab, the work that they do, and so, so much more. So if you guys are as excited as I am, let's buckle up and dive in. I'm gonna welcome in Maddie Sherman, and then I'm gonna play you a little bit of a wild hope teaser uh, to get you guys equipped to get excited for today's broadcast. So Maddie, welcome into the broadcast. We'll say a quick hello. How are you doing today? Here we are. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this amazing day in Hawaii. It is raining like crazy. Um, so we're going to try and keep this nice and sweet out here. Um, but my name is Madeline Sherman. Uh, I'm the project manager for the Coral Resilience Lab at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Um, and so today I'm just gonna show you a little bit about some corals that we have. But um, Jesse, if you wanted to go ahead and show that video. Fantastic, yes, we've got a little teaser. And I wanna note the entire video of your Wild Hope episode is online. So I'll make sure all our classes have that as well. But let's start off with this. Coral is a foundation species that all of the other animals and plants and algae build from. Without coral, you lose a whole ecosystem. In our lab, we do different ways of approaching coral restoration. One is selective breeding. You first have to identify which parents are thermally tolerant and we bring those into the lab and expose those to heat stress. We ramp the temperature up and then we bring it back down and we can assess a coral's resilience. We're seeking out these resilient corals so that we have insurance in the reef. We can see how the corals are gonna do in about 70 years from now. What we've learned so far is that thermal tolerance is definitely a trait that can be inherited and that's really exciting because that shows how we can continue to improve thermal tolerance over time. With known thermally tolerant corals in the reef, they make those reefs more resilient and that's our hope. Very cool. A big thank you to the Wild Hope team for pulling that together, for Kira and Maddie for showing up in that video. And Maddie, we'll take it back to you to explore a little bit about the lab outdoors. So, hello everyone. So, where I am right now, we are in our tank land space. So, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of tanks, and that's where we have all our corals. But to give you a little sense of where I am right now, so I'm in the Coral Resilience Lab at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, which is on a small little island called Moku'olo'e. Jesse, if you want to uh, put that picture up for everyone. 
And so Moka Oloe is a small little island off the coast of Kaneohe Bay within Oahu. Um, and Oahu is part of a larger island chain called the Hawaii Island. So I'm an island off an island of an island chain. And so the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, we are a marine institute that does all different kinds of research from uh, studying whales all the way down to little microbes. And the Coral Resilience Lab, what we do here is we want to understand coral and how they are changing uh, with a changing environment and how we can understand that and use that for management and also for restoration. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of the corals that we have here in the tank. So if you want to come over here. So can everyone see this tank right here? So these are some of the corals that we do our work on. So this is called a rice coral or a Montipra capitata. And this is the main species that we find out here in Kaneohe Bay. And as you can see, it's got this beautiful plating pattern. And it's called rice coral. I'm sure you can tell because it's got all these tiny little bumps all across it over here. Beautiful coral right there. Another coral that we have is this coral right here called the finger coral or the Paredes compressa. So this is our finger coral and it's called finger coral because they look like fingers, just like that. And another common coral that we have here is our lace coral or Pasolopra acuta. So yeah, beautiful lace coral right there. And so what all of these corals have in common, although they all look kind of different, is that they are all animals and they are all animals in the group Cnidaria. And Cnidarias are like jellyfish and sea anemones and Portuguese man o' war. And so corals, they are animals and they have little stinging cells. They have little tentacles with stinging cells and they can sting their prey or they can sting predators um, and they can actually feed themselves. But here in Hawaii, most of the coral they don't actually get their own food. They rely on their symbiotic relationship with algae called zooxanthellae. And this relationship between the coral and the zooxanthellae is critical to the health of the coral. And here in Hawaii, about 90% of its food comes from that zooxanthellae. So the zooxanthellae, they're, they're kind of like marine plants. And so they're getting their energy from the sun and then they're sharing that energy with the coral. And so we study that relationship and we study what happens when that relationship gets broken down. Um, but one of the biggest things that we do here in the Coral Resilience Lab is actually coral spawning. So coral spawning is a magical time of the year when um, in the summer, we especially look at these guys, the Montipra capitata. So just like clockwork, um, around the new moon, a couple days after the new moon, this, this rice coral will release beautiful little gametes into the water. So Jesse's got a video that he'll pull up right over there. As this is playing, I just want to note that this is one of my favorite things in all of nature. And Maddie's lucky to work in a place where they get to play around with this and see this all the time. But in the oceans, when coral spawning happens, it's like thousands of corals and millions and millions of eggs. And it's like, like fireworks underwater. It's one of the coolest things that you can see in all of nature. I'll try and find some other videos too when we're done uh, to get our classes extra excited about all this. This is amazing, Maddie. Thank you so much for this video. Yeah, coral spawning is like our favorite time of the year too. As coral people, it's, it's so fun. But so what we do is we can go out on a boat or we can actually get our, um, our breeding co colonies that I'll show you in just a second. But so we'll go out and we'll scoop up all, all of those little floating um, gametes at the top. And then we'll, we can bring those back into the lab and we can separate them into egg and sperm and then fertilize the, the corals how we want. And then from there, they become little tiny free-swimming larvae. And then the larvae um, 
after we babysit them for maybe about five days or so um, in our little conical system, then those babies can settle onto little plugs and they can become little baby corals just like this. So this coral here, this is about a two-year-old coral. And I'll show another one over here. This is also a two-year-old coral. So you can see in just a couple of years, they've not grown too, too big, but they've grown a significant amount. And then they're on these plugs. These are called aragonite plugs. And they're very similar to the skeletal composition of the coral. So those are little baby two-year-olds right there. So I'll put those back. But what we're really excited about in our lab is that this year, we actually have six-year-old corals that we're hoping that we can crossbreed. So if you want to come follow me over here. Maddie. I'm going to really quickly bring up a, just a quick picture, too, so you can see some of our corals when they're really young as well. I know that it's a tiny, tiny bit blurry for our audience at home. So in this picture, you see some of these really young corals, how tiny they are. And you saw them in Maddie's hands there, uh, but just as a sense of what they look like a little up close. Fantastic. All right. Right. And so these, these corals right here, this is like the best thing that could ever happen and uh, that could ever come from our lab. So these are going to be six years old this summer. And these are corals that came from two non-bleached parrots, meaning that the corals did not bleach when there was a back-to-back -back bleaching event in 2014 and 2015. So a little bit about coral bleaching. So coral bleaching is when that relationship between the coral animal and the algae gets broken down. And so we still don't really understand if the coral gets rid of the algae or if the algae leaves. And that's something that we're studying in the lab currently. It seems like it's a simple concept, but it's actually really difficult to understand. So when a coral bleaches, it gets rid of that algae and it appears white because the algae is what gives it its color. And so you're losing all of that nutrition that the coral is sharing with the algae. And so then the coral, it might starve and it might die. But there are these special corals that we call non-bleaching corals or resilient corals that we are seeking out. We're, we're looking for them. Uh, we've actually tagged them out into the field. And we, um, we were able to collect the babies that came from them and make these beautiful six-year-olds here. So when corals get to be about six years old, that's when they start to start to spawn themselves. And so we're really, really excited because this year we're hoping that we'll actually get another generation from these non-bleaching corals um, and we'll have even more resilient babies from that. But you can see just from the two-year-olds to the six-year-olds how big these have grown. These are like, I don't know, 20 times the size or something. You can see just on this one. You see how beautiful and big that one is? That is a gorgeous coral. Like it's truly like one of the more beautiful corals that I think I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. And that started just from a tiny little baby larvae. Tiny, tiny little baby larvae. And so we are really, really excited about these corals. All right. And then something else that we do in the lab is we test for thermal resilience. So, and how we do that is we have a state of the art, one of the kind, one of the only places that you'll find in the world we have a tank system that we can control with our computers that will actually change the temperature of the water. It takes a reading every five seconds. Um, and we're able to um, have it read uh, future ocean conditions from even um, about 70 years from now. So if you wanna follow me, I can show you a little bit of that and some of the experiments that we have going on in there. Amazing. And while you're doing that, while you're walking there, I brought up that picture again so you can see some of those younger corals. So this is a perfect example of this where we're changing the temperature over time. We're seeing which corals stay pretty healthy. We're seeing which ones bleach. So you can see that there's quite a big difference in this picture that Maddie sent me in advance of the broadcast. So spectacular illustration of all that. Ah. This is quite the lab setup, by the way. Our students uh, might not have the context of this, but this is like an incredible facility that you have with some really high-tech toys. This is very fun. <laughs> we have some some pretty awesome toys that hopefully I'll get to show you in just a bit as well. That makes our lives so much easier. So we'll get to the coral robots in just a second. Um, but this is like the one of the best things that we've 
uh, that we're able to do in our lab. So this is just one tank. We have about 20 of these tanks um, and we can put racks in here. And then you can see over here. So this is actually the controller box. So this gets hooked up to a computer and the computer will actually tell it at what temperature the tank needs to be. And there's inflow of warm water, cool water, and then ambient water. Um, and if you pan out over here, those are the, the warm water reservoirs. And then we actually have chillers right behind it. And so, like I said, it'll take a reading every five seconds. And whoops, there we go. So it'll take a reading every five seconds and then it'll control the water to what we tell it to be. And so if we want to have corals under a, um, a three week stress test, Typically, we'll start at about 26 degrees Celsius, and then it'll get all the way up to 32 Celsius, which is really hot for the coral. Um, and just to give you a little perspective, so corals in Hawaii don't really like to live anywhere above about 28 degrees Celsius. So 32 is way above what they're used to. And we typically start to see bleaching around that 27 to 28 line. But if we go into this tank right here, so this tank is set for uh, 20 temperatures that are going to be in 2050 and we have tanks that are historic uh, temperatures from 2020 all the way up to 2095 so we can kind of predict how the corals are going to be uh, in the future and like I said this is one of the this state-of-the-art facility we are one of the only places in the world that has this facility and so we're able to do a lot of really really awesome work just in this area right here um, but going back to the robot so I'm really excited to show you some of the, the awesome um, things that we have created to help make our lives easier. So if you want to follow me into the dry part of the lab, I think we're, we're good on the outside here. I'm getting a little, a little chilly from this rain. So. I think so. <laughs> Maddie taking us inside after standing in a torrential downpour and under vague amounts of, of covering over the last little bit. It's not very often that we ask this of our speakers, so we really appreciate the effort to, to take us outside today. This is amazing. Huh. All right. I think we might be ever so temporarily frozen. When we get back inside, we are going to be cooking with gas while we're waiting for her to get back. Oh, I think she's back. Never mind. We don't need to wait at all. We'll do it. Get back to Maddie. We're hey, back. We're back. <laughs> all right. So first is this machine. So this machine is called the PAM, and this is what this is the machine that we use to actually take the reading of the overall uh, uh, photosynthetic activity of the coral. So when we do bleaching experiments um, out in those tanks, we will actually come in here during the nighttime, um, and we'll have the corals dark acclimate so that they kind of chill out before we put them into this machine, and then we can put the window down here. And then this really high tech camera takes a photo of the coral and it's able to tell you what the total photosynthetic activity of that coral is. And then so from that data, we can we can determine which corals are doing better when they're under that thermal stress test or which ones are, are not doing so good. So that's the PAM and PAM stands for it's a very large science word post amplitude modulation. You don't have to know any of that. I don't think that's going to be on the Kahoot. <laughs> I don't know. Here. No, it won't. I promise you will not hear that on the goat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this fun machine right here is called the Fragrammeter. So the Fragrammeter, we can put a little coral, a little coral fragment right here, right in this um, this well right there. And there's all of these high high definition cameras along here, and the coral fragment will actually spin. And then from all of those pictures, we can stitch together and we can make a 3D coral model of just that fragment. And that only takes about 20 seconds max. And that is actually gonna save a lot of time because it's, it's creating this 3D image that we can go back and forth to. We can track changes of that coral over time and it minimizes the amount of uh, time that the coral is out of the water. So we have water wells right in here that the corals will sit in until they're ready to get put into the fragrammeter, get a little spin, maybe get a little dizzy and then we'll put them back and then they're nice and happy again. And again, we can uh, track track a lot of uh, measurements over time with that. So that's really helpful. That's helped save a lot of time. Um, and then our last robot that I'll show you today is over here. Don't mind the rainbow light over there. That's just a light acclimation experiment going on. So this is the camera gantry. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing going on right now in, in any of these machines. 
But this is a, also another water well, and this is a really high definition camera that's controlled by a computer. Um, and this takes high definition photos of the baby corals that I showed you in the first place. Um, so the fragmenter takes uh, models or takes pictures and makes models of adult coral. This is for the baby corals. And so it'll zoom in really, really close and it'll be very accurate um, to the baby coral. And we're able to see that growth over time again. Uh, so the camera gantry and the fragmenter are just two, uh, two, two robots that we have designed and engineered that are making our lives so much easier. Um, so that's just a couple of the things that I wanted to show you. I'm gonna go hop onto my computer so we can do a little bit of a Q&A now. I'm so excited to answer all of your questions. Fantastic, Maddie, that was spectacular. And also you're the first person in the history of exploring by the seat of your pants to walk by a bunch of rainbow things and be like, don't mind the rainbow things. You might have to come back to that one in a minute. I think we're gonna get a question or two about that. Uh, while you're heading to the, oh, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, uh, these are just some rainbow tanks and um, this is a light acclimation experiment. So uh, one of our lab technicians is looking in to see what is uh, the best light that you can actually outplant a coral at. And um, if, if it depends, if it's in the, in the field versus in the lab, because when things are in the lab, they're a little bit different than when they're in the field. Um, so that's kind of what this is looking at. But yeah, they're just, we painted them rainbow because they're nice and fun. <laughs> yeah, it's very fun. Thank you so much yeah. for playing that. As you're heading back, actually, what I realized I'll do is I'll play our Kahoot together. So you can head back to the lab. I know you got to switch cameras in a minute. So I'm going to cue this up as you do that. Uh, folks, thank you so much for sticking around for all of that. This has been so much fun for me personally. I've learned a lot and it's only been 20 minutes in. We've got a whole big Q&A to come. If you are new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. So please do um, join in and get those answers in as quickly as possible. I've got to cue this up and exit my screen share that I have with the other thing. Uh, and what you're going to win for winning the Kahoot is the everlasting respect of Maddie, the Coral Resilience team, and I. So it's it's a big deal. Um, <laughs> let's get this queued up. So many of you are coming in. This is fantastic. And uh, Maddie, you're back at the other computer now. If you want to help us out with little hints with a few seconds to go in each of these Kahoot things, that would be marvelous. But welcome to Kahoot if you haven't seen one of these before. Super, super fun. Oh, uh, I'm a Kahoot expert. Expert? I'm not even a Kahoot <laughs> expert. I'm still an amateur. Gee, this is going to be to be in the presence of an expert. It's very exciting. All right, here we go. Starting our Kahoot. Question one, everybody. Three, two, one. Okay. I was too fast saying three, two, one. Can you tell I'm excited? <laughs> All right, the Coral Resilience Lab is in. Where are we? We talked about it at the beginning. I hope everyone gets this right. Are we in Australia, Borneo, Cuba, <laughs> or Hawaii? All places with coral reefs nearby, but one specific place for today. It's very cool that we get to be here. And look at this picture. Honestly, like, is there a better work site in the entire world? I don't know. I really, I, I don't think so. No. <laughs> 54 answers. Yes, most of you got this. It is Hawaii. We are in the United States. We are in, don't tell the rest of the United States. I think we might be in the best part of the United States. Um, that's very exciting. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Uh, let's see what that does to our leaderboard. Number one, happy koala in the lead with Amazon Echidna right behind. Question two. All right. True or false? Maddie, you covered this pretty well. Coral are symbiotic and comprised of partner organisms working together. I don't know. It seems... Seems likely, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we learned a cool term. I think I still have it. Yes, we learned Zuzentele not too long ago. It's, it, you know what? When I was a kid, no one knew Zuzentele. And now a lot of kids know this term. So if you didn't know it, <laughs> no, tell your friends. Act smart. Yes, true. Multiple organisms working together. Coral's a partnership, which is really, really cool. There aren't that many creatures in the world that are quite like coral. It's a very special uh, animal algae relationship. Epic crab takes our lead. You are epic indeed, crab. Good job. Quiz number three. Coral reefs turning white and shedding their zooxanthellae is called what? Skeletonizing? Dying? Bleaching? Or this never happens? Coral are always colorful. They're never, they're fine. I don't know why this ended up with a picture of an anemone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I pressed. Um, let's see. I think a lot of kids know this now. This is the thing that, again, when I was a boy, no one knew this. And 48 of you on the ball, bleaching. Yes. Maddie, you're, you're just, you're such a good explainer. They're killing it. They're like 90% right. This is amazing. 
Yay! Right. <laughs> Epic Crab has our lead going to our final question, and we're going to head to Mr. Shadditch's class for a question not long after that. Coral reefs can rejuvenate and thrive if given the chance. What was I talking about at the beginning? Wild hope. It's not wild despair. It's not the coral, oh no, we're doomed lab. It's the coral resilience lab, because of course the answer is true. So you have six seconds to get that in if you haven't gotten it in. It's true. True, true, true. Um, in fact, we've done a lot of things with Australia, with Borneo, with other places. Coral reefs are in danger, they're threatened, there's a lot of risk that they face, but it's work from Maddie and her team at the Coral Resilience Lab that are making it possible for a future for coral reefs. So there's lots of hope. The 12 of you that thought false, you're wrong. Um, be optimistic. There's so much to explore and discover. It's a really exciting time in conservation, and this is what we want to impart upon you during this broadcast. Fabulous Turtles in second, Polite Orders is third, and for the Marbles, by 22 points, Drum roll, please, it is epic. Crab took it like almost wire to wire. Way to go. Okay. Nice. That was an amazing dude. Thank you so much for, for joining with that. We're going to go to our Q&A now. YouTubers, keep sharing those questions. Mr. Shattuck and Deep River, come on in and take us away. Hey, guys. Um, how old can corals get and what's the oldest one you have? Ooh. Ooh. Great question. So corals, I think the oldest one on record is about 4,000 years old, which is insane. Um, corals, they can keep growing and keep getting big if their habitat allows them to, you know, if they're not getting destroyed by anything. Um, the oldest corals that we have in our lab, so like I said, we grew those six-year-olds from babies, um, but some of the, the coral fragments that we get from adults, they might be even older than that. They might be 20 years old. Um, but yeah, the oldest one, I think it's 4,000 or so, so really old. Maddie, we get this question in all our broadcasts, regardless of species, like, how old is the oldest thing? And almost no one ever has an answer. So the fact that you had such a ready, the, like, in the chamber answer to that is spectacular. Thank you very much. And great question to kick us off, guys. I'm going to do a really quick screen share before I head to Miss Steinoff's class, just so that I can show you guys something that was in our presentation that we didn't get to in the midst of all that, which is the replanting process. So going out and putting the coral back in the wild is so... Astonishing. Do you, have you done this personally, Maddie? Like this looks like the most yeah, fun yeah. thing of all time. Yes. Yeah. Like, oh, so, so yeah, I would love to talk about this. So um, we, one of the big projects that we have is called Restore with Resilience. And so that's what all these pictures are from. So these are all pictures from outplants that we put out into Kaneohe Bay. Um, and these are actually thermally tolerant corals. So these are corals that um, we showed to have, uh, be able to withstand those higher temperatures. Um, so the corals that we put into those tanks and we stress test them, um, the ones that the ones that do perform well under that stress test, those are the corals that we go back to and we um, put put out onto the reef. And so the whole goal of that is we want to kind of seed the reef with these little resilient corals so that over time, uh, when they grow and they're able to reproduce, they're creating um, a overall resilience of that reef. So basically what we do in those pictures <laughs> we we can drill a little hole into that reef. Um, so in that top top left picture, the person on the right, that's Josh. Um, he's he has an underwater drill, and so he's um, drilling just a little bit in, into a uh, not a uh, a dead coral over there. And so we uh, we'll put um, the live coral on top of the dead coral. Um, but basically, so those corals they're on those little plugs, and then the person on the right, that's Tegan. She has a um, very special glue gun that has marine grade epoxy in it um and she's putting a little dab of glue um into that little hole that josh just drilled and then we'll place that little coral fragment um into that little hole and then it cures in a couple seconds and then you can see to the picture on that top right um all of those little all of those little coral out plants on that reef are um what we've put out there and then those pictures on the bottom the the one in the middle and then the one on the right so that's a finger coral and then the one on the right is a rice coral so those are some of the little fragments that we put out there um and then over time we'll see them double and triple and quadruple in size and then um the like i said the whole goal is so that they will um get big enough and old enough to reproduce and eventually seed the reef with resilient corals I am going to throw professional detachment out the window for a minute and just say, like, I get to hear inspiring and exciting conservation and science stories all the time. This is, like, the ultimate example. Like, if you're going to literally take one thing in the whole world of conservation of, like, 
what could scientists do really, really right? It's this. It's this whole story of like, we look, we research, we understand, we test, we find the best things, we put them back in a situation where they're likely to thrive, and we monitor that over time. Like, that is conservation at its absolute best in the world, and I'm so glad we got a chance to tell that story. So thank you, Maddie, yes. very much for that. Yeah, thank um, you for being here. Ms. Steinoff's class, I want to head to you guys in Guelph. Come on in. And Ms. Morrow, we're heading to you guys next. Uh, hi, guys. Hello. Hello. What are some of the oldest corals in Hawaii? Ooh. Ooh. That's a good question. That's a question I actually don't know the answer to. So thank you for keeping me on my toes. <laughs> we've, stumped we've stumped the expert. We did this earlier in our bird broadcast, too. We're just having a great day. So great question. And this is where it's important to know that scientists don't necessarily have all the answers. Uh, science is always a process of discovery. You guys can find out things that Mattia doesn't know, that I don't know, that the top scientists in the world don't know. It's one of the joys of the whole field. So thank you for that question. Um, Miss Morrow's group, I'm going to head to you guys. Unmute your mic. Come on in and take us away in Newtown. Hi, guys. Huh? What can we do to help save the coral? What can we do? This has been asked on YouTube too. So this is going to cover uh, Ms. Ferguson's question as well. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. So my, the way I like to answer this is like education and awareness is the number one thing that you can do as an individual. Um, so taking the information that I've shared with you today, telling your friends, telling your family, because a lot of people don't really know that coral is a living animal. Um, and so the more that people understand it and the more that people know that, you know, there are threats that corals are facing, I think the, the mindset of the general public can change. And so ed educating yourself, educating others, that is the most important thing that you can do. I'm um, taking it a step above that. Um, just being mindful about, you know, the little everyday actions that we all do um, and how, you know, maybe you can you can change cer certain behaviors that you do that are more sustainable. So for example, um, like turning turning off the water when you're not using it, um, using biodegradable soap products, um, and just adapting a more sustainable and healthy lifestyle. Yep. Maddie, that is a fantastic answer. I'm so glad we got that question from multiple angles all at once. And this is something that all the answers you gave are true for not just coral reefs, but pretty much every bit of wildlife in the world little action that we can all do and so many kids in this generation are already doing so honestly kids keep it up everything that you're doing right now you know the science and you know the the advocacy better than we did in our generation you guys are doing an amazing job keep it up and you'll make uh, a really big difference for coral and for wildlife around the globe Addie, we're going to take a few questions from YouTubers because you guys have been an amazing audience sharing questions there so miss tamash's class joining us all the way in alaska which is close to you, but almost as far different a landscape as you can have in the United yeah, States. Yeah. It's very exciting. They want to know what your favorite thing about coral is. No pressure at all. Oh. I know. Oh. Yeah. That is, that's so hard to answer. My favorite thing about coral, honestly, it's probably coral spawning. I just feel like that's such a magical time for everything. I think it's so amazing that they're able to time with time time that the time that they release their babies with in their own species so there's you know no one species releases their uh their babies at the same time and i think that that's so amazing so for example the rice coral it's five days after the the new moon and then for the thing um the sorry the another parietes species it's like a couple days after the full moon um, and they time it completely differently. So rice coral is about 9 p.m. And then the other coral is about midnight. Um, so it's just the fact that they're able to know this. And yeah, it's it's insane. It's crazy. It is insane. I'm going to make sure, honestly, classes, there are some great videos online of further coral spawning. I can send you this slide deck as well so you can see that sort of in the lab experience. It's very, very cool. It's one of my favorite things in all of nature, as I said. Great question, guys. All right. Adelaide in Miss Parkinson's class is asking so many questions. So we're going to take a two-part one. Um, do corals have brains? And does coral feel things? What do we think? What do we know? So corals do not have a brain, um, but they can feel things in a sense. So like if something were to, to go across it, like I said, they have those little stinging cells. And so it would be able to sense it or feel it in a way. 
so that you know if it, if it was a prey item they were able to to catch it or if it was a predator then they sting it the um Geez, by the way, the moment you said uh, Coral don't have brains, uh, if I only had a brain came into my head from Wizard of Oz, which is going to be way beyond most of our kids who have never seen that, but thank you for that reference in my day. Um, <laughs> Matt, we're going to head back to our live classes for a minute. We've got tons of time in this Q&A, which rocks. So, Mr. Shattuck, we're back to you guys. Five sixes, come on in. Hey. What was the biggest Coral you found? The biggest? Yeah. 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 Perfect. The biggest Coral that I outplanted? Yeah, planted, found, a bit of both. Mm. Well, the biggest coral that I found was maybe like the size of it, it's too big to even be able to get <laughs> it was really big and I actually I went diving on Wednesday and I saw it and I was like oh my goodness that's like one of the biggest colonies of that species I've ever seen um it was huge it was probably the size of like uh one of those little smart cars maybe you know what I'm talking about the little little cube cars <laughs> It was really big. I was I was so surprised. Um, but I obviously left that alone. Um, and then one of the biggest that I've outplanted, honestly, we don't really outplant them too big. We we try and get corals that are about this big, not nothing bigger. Um, and we actually outplant smaller ones because if they're smaller and we cut them up, then they uh, they actually grow faster when they're when awesome. like that. So that's, that's why we. That covers a question that I think we were probably going to get, which is just the idea of like, when do you plant them? Is there an optimal time? Do you know how they grow? So small ones will grow faster. There's no like reduced, there's no increased mortality for putting out small ones as opposed to a bit of a bigger one. Like you just want them to get to a stable size and then they're good to go and they do pretty well from there. Yeah, so actually we have another experiment in our lab that's investigating exactly that. Like, is it better to outplant whole colonies or is it better to outplant uh, small fragments. And so that's under the, the Restore Resilience Project. So we have one site where we've only outplanted whole colonies and then um, two other sites where we've outplanted the fragments. Um, and then we're tracking them over time to see, you know, what's growing faster or if they're reproducing, you know, how how quickly are they reproducing um, and finding those trade-offs between, between that. Super, super cool. Man, I want to come work for you. This sounds so much fun. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Steinoff's class, come on back in, guys. Thanks for your patience and take us away. How cold does the water have to be for the coral to be happy? How cold? So typically the water is around 26 Celsius. Um, I think that's about 73 Fahrenheit, I think, if I'm right. Um, I'll find out. <laughs> yeah, find out. <laughs> but yeah, so... Um, year you know year round corals will be living in about 73 um fahrenheit and that's typically what what we find um there are corals that like to live in a little bit of cooler water um but yeah and then like i said if it gets hotter than about 20 28 celsius maybe 29 celsius that's typically when we start to see um mass coral bleaching this is really interesting. By the way, 26 Celsius, I just confirmed, is 78.8 Fahrenheit, so a little bit warmer so, than our 73. Well, okay, yeah. But I'm so glad you mentioned that there's such a big difference between, like, the happy coral temperature and the coral not-too-happy temperature. Same with our bodies. I mean, honestly, you go from 98.6 to 102, and that's a very big difference between you're totally good and you're in the hospital. And this is something that we find in a lot of wildlife around the world, and we really notice this in coral. It's why it's become such a conservation icon and something that we're working to find the most resilient sort of members of each species for because that little tiny bit of difference which we're seeing in global climate change generally makes a big impact on the survival of these organisms so great question miss steinoff's class miss morrow we're heading to you we'll take a couple more from youtube and then we're gonna wrap up not too long after that time flies and you're having fun everybody newtown hi guys go ahead me okay what happens if coral goes extinct could you repeat that i'm oh. sorry yeah what happens if coral goes extinct maddie Ooh. So um, I hope that we never get to that point, um, but we will see a lot of uh, ecosystems kind of crash. So corals are what we call a foundational species. They're keystone species. And so they're able to kind of indicate the health of that environment. Um, and they are foundation for a lot of uh, the other species in that ecosystem. So if we see a loss of coral, Typically what happens is all of the other organisms that are living in that ecosystem, they either have to go somewhere else or they might they might just 
you know, die. I, um, and so if we see all of the coral go extinct, um, that whole ecosystem in the ocean is going to crash. And then what that means for us on land is that the, the uh, temperature is going to get hotter. We're going to see a lot more natural disasters because corals are actually uh, responsible for buffering a lot of wave energy. So um, for a tsunami's example, um, when those those heavy waves come crashing in from, from the open ocean, they actually stop at the coral reefs first, and then we only see a, a small percentage of what that actually was. So if we were to lose uh, our coral reef, we'd see a lot of... Um, a lot more uh, of these large waves coming onto shore. It could cause erosion. Um, and then just, you know, all, all of this, these disasters are just going to be more frequent and, and more heavy. Well, so we get this question all the time, and I, I really like to harp on this, especially when it comes to coral, because there are individual species in the world that if we lost, it can seem like, oh, we've lost a kind of moth. And I always make the case that all wildlife is inherently valuable. Who are we to sort of make a species extinct? And honestly, we, we the more we study wildlife and understand it, the more we recognize how foundational a lot of species that we thought were, who cares, are actually very important. Coral is the exact opposite of that. Coral is a really, really major part of ecosystems, of protecting humans, of saving habitat or as habitat for lots of fish. So as Maddie mentioned, if we lose coral, uh, a lot of things are going to be in a lot of trouble. So it's really important that the work of the Coral Resilience Lab continue. And around the globe, we work to protect these amazing, amazing creatures because they're really special and they're very, very important. So thank you guys for that amazing question. Maddie, I'm gonna take one quick more one from YouTube as we had a student ask a bunch and I wanna make sure he gets a question. And Ajmal wants to know, um, how many coral reefs are there? You can tell us for species or just places around the world where there are coral before we wrap up in a minute. Yeah, another one that is so <laughs> difficult to, to be able to, to say how many coral reefs are there, I would guess that there's probably millions of them. I mean, there's, if you look at the map of where all the corals grow, it's pretty equatorial. Um, and here in Hawaii, I mean, we, we probably have thousands or hundreds of thousands of reefs. So that's a really, really hard thing to be able to quantify. Um, I can tell you how many species we of corals we have here in Hawaii. We have about, depending on who you ask, uh, <laughs> we have between 70 and 80 species of coral versus other places in the world, like Indonesia, for example, they could have 700 species. Um, so actually here in Hawaii, we have a very low diversity and it's because we're so isolated. Interesting, thank you for that detailed answer, Maddie. And, and we do a lot of Indonesian coral stuff, so it's been really special to talk to the, uh, the Hawaiian perspective and showcase what you're doing. And I mean, again, what really defines you is this really special amount of, of the, the science and the technology that are put into understanding coral in a way that can help them be resilient for centuries to come is what makes you guys so, so special. So I really want to encourage our classes, coralresiliencelab.com. I will make sure all our registered groups have this. Check out Wild Hope TV. I will get you the full Wild Hope episodes. If you want like a 25 minute program on the lab, on Maddie's work uh, and more, I'll make sure you guys have that. Check out our Wild Hope series. You can follow along with the series. We've got six more coming in May alone, and this program will be on our YouTube channel. So if you want to watch this in three weeks or three years or share with all your friends and help protect coral like we talked about, lots of opportunity to do just that. Um, Maddie, before we wrap up together, um, is there any last message you want to leave us with about coral before we bring in our kids to say thank you and farewell? I just want to thank you all for being so excited to learn about coral. I mean, I, I never thought when I was your age that I would grow up to be a coral nerd like I am. I think corals are the coolest things ever. And so thank you all so much for your excitement and just, you know, keep, keep being curious, keep asking these questions because that's really what's going to, you know, spread the word and help, help maybe save the world one day. So again, thank you all so much. Couldn't be a better message than that. Maddie, it's been such a thrill having you on today. Thank you so, so much. We're going to bring in Mr. Shadows class to say thank you and farewell. And YouTubers, if you want to scream at home in Alaska and Ontario, wherever you're joining from, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>